The heat capacity of a dry soil is only a, a, a small fraction of what uh, water is. You know, so the more water that gets into the, into the soil, the more heat storage you're going to be able to have. So you have that. And then we have what we talked about before, the, the um, sandy soil, the coarse sandy soil versus the fine clay soils. You're going to have a better performance with the clay soils in conductivity. And conductivity is, is what's going to allow you to transfer that heat from the soil to the pipe wall, to, from the pipe wall to the air in the pipe wall. However, once the water gets into the sand, it's going to make a big difference, and that's going to jump past the clay, um, but that's only when it's wet. So, you know, they have to think about that. Yeah, the, you know, the point of operation I would think about is to literally dig, dig a, drill a long, deep post hole into the ground um, and just see what's down there, what kind of soil's down there. Now, the, you're always going to have an issue or a potential issue with rocks and stuff. I mean, we, we were lucky we ran into a kind of a, there's a name for it, and I forget what it is, it's sort of a, a very flaky, easily crumbled kind of stuff, which, uh, you know, which the, which the uh, teeth on the grate on the digger could, could crumble up. And, uh, you know, we could, I was taking pi metal pipes and stuff and smashing it and stuff, but it was easy to get through. But if you hit a boulder or granite or whatever, that's, you know, that's going to put a big hole in your plans. I mean, you, I don't, you know, you might go around it, you might be able to shift the whole trench over if you weren't already, if you hadn't already dug that much, you might be able to drill holes in it and uh, chisel it till it broke. You know, there's ways of smashing rocks up, but I mean, that's not uh, a welcome sight when you're coming through here and you run into a big something. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> that, you know, that's, um, that's an expensive proposition. Um, and the chimney, again, I said, you know, the, uh, I had a little drawing in there in your handout of the, no, not in the handout, that was in the, uh, in the, in the presentation, but the, um, you know, that chimney could be a little bit broader. It could be up to three feet instead of the two feet that it is. So I think it's two feet. Let me see what we had. It's two and it's from the outside. So we could go up to three on that. It'd probably be more effective. Um, and in, by effective, I mean it will start working earlier in the morning and start and continue working later in the evening or in the afternoon. In the evening or in the afternoon, the, uh, heat is going to be substantially greater because you have the whole day to build up heat in the atmosphere and the soil and everything. So the heat's going to be greater in the afternoon anyway, but it's always nice to have that little bit at the end. You can add to it, you know, more, more ventilation. We've got 198 cubic feet a minute of airflow. That's one pipe. So we have three pipes. Um, and the types of pipe itself, uh, you know, can make a difference. The type we used is a smooth walled slippery plastic pipe, which is ideal for our situation. Um, if you've got a really good price on some eight inch corrugated steel, that might be something to think about. But again, you'd have a turbulent flow situation, which would require more, um, more um, powered fan need. Uh, a bigger solar chimney would cover that, but it would be also drawing from more of the core of the pipe than, than from the outside. The outside's going to be spinning it and roughing it up, and then the inside's going to be where the flow takes place. So uh, that's you know, something to think about. It has a greater surface area with a corrugated pipe. Um, but I think the cheapest and most effective pipe as far as like expense and practicality and everything else is probably going to be plastic PVC. Piping between 4 and 12 inches in diameter, I think we talked about that out, out there. Going too big is expensive. Going too small is not going to work. You don't want to like a really rushing air through there. The faster you make that air go through there, the less heat the less residency time it's going to have. In other words, the less time it's going to have to absorb that cold. Even if the cool is there waiting to be sucked out, if the air is moving too fast, it's not going to take it. So, you know, you want to keep it. Uh, I think uh, some of these studies, uh, the 300 CFM was about the, the fairly aggressive number. 300 is, you know, up there is the top. So 198 is, you know, almost 200. Um, at the lower end, I really don't know. I mean, probably, um, you know, maybe 150, something like that. So pipe depth, ten, five to 10 feet. Pipe spacing, five feet minimum. Make contingencies for draining the water out of the bottom of the pipe. The standpipe at the lowest point of the pipe. You have to make sure those pipes are flat. So you don't, want to, you don't want the floor of that thing doing like this because if it does get water in there, you're never gonna be able to get it out in those dips. So it has to be straight and it has to be pitched a little bit down towards the exit end so the air will wanna flow downhill and also the water will flow downhill and you can suck it out there. So a six-inch diameter tube has an area 
you know, area of 28 uh, and a quarter square inches. So we're looking at about 250 feet per minute or speed of air going through there almost three miles an hour. So that's a, you know, that's a good, um, a good speed to go through there. It takes about 45 seconds for it to make its little trip from the head of opening to the other end of it. And you, uh, if you go through and look at other design parameters on here and websites and stuff, you'll see a various range of flows. Um, you know, uh, some of those tr uh, residency times are down eight, eight, eight seconds, 10 seconds. I mean, that's a, a, a fairly fast and aggressive flow, but they also, um, you know, may have, a, may have a different pipe diameter or whatever. So it's, it's, you know, sort of a matter of reading and trying to figure it out. You're basically looking at flow the specific heat of air itself, and the difference in temperature between the inlet and the outlet, what, you, what you're aiming for. So if you're coming in at 90 and you want 65 at the other end, you've got that much to that subtraction. So it's basically the, the density of air is, is less than 0 0.075, the density of, um, of normal air at 60 degrees. Um, and then uh, you can calculate uh, in some of these charts, you can go back and for your situation, you can calculate the flow um, uh, how many feet per minute? Basically, the you know the the uh, capacity of the air flowing through that tube, and so if you multiply the flow times the specific heat of the air times the difference in temperature, you can pretty much come to a to a rough estimate of what your um, cooling capacity will be or your cooling results will be. You know, typically this um, you might like an air conditioner is so many tons of cooling, you know, one ton, two tons, whatever, something like this is going to provide, you know, fractional amounts, like small, less than one ton. But, you know, it's still free. I mean, it's, you know, for whatever you do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you couldn't put a highly efficient air conditioner in there and um, operate it very carefully and come out with some great results. But, you know, basically what you're looking at is a coefficient of performance. So that's basically how much energy you need to make it work to how much energy you've, you know, you've saved at the other side, you know, the, um, you know, you got a coefficient of performance and, you know, maybe three or five or something. Uh, air, an air conditioner is measured like that. And for whatever reason, the coefficient of performance, which say is three, is, um, is multiplied by 3.41 to get what they call a SEER number. And that's what you see when you buy an air conditioner, it'll say, or a heat pump, it'll say SEER 14 or SEER 16. So that's basically, you divide that by 3.41 and you're going to get the coefficient of performance, which is basically what we really need to know. That's basically is I'm, I'm using so many kilowatt hours of energy to cool. I'm using 10 of energy to cool to uh, 30 points of energy. So that's basically a three, a three point gain. And that's really, you know, you're looking at, you don't want to have negative because then it'd be no point at all, you know, so. I'm thinking more of greenhouse usage so I'm, my main concern is keeping a more constant temperature inside the greenhouse because mm -hmm. throughout our days around here it fluctuates so much mm -hmm. yeah. love. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder not just the cooling possibilities but the heating possibilities and is there a way to kind of create a closed circuit system taking the air that's coming out of the chimney and pumping it back in during the evening when it's already warmed like the heat exchange stuff. Yeah, that, w that makes, that sounds like a good idea, but the point is that the chimney and nothing in that building has enough mass to hold enough heat for that to work more than 15 minutes. So what if I was doing, I'm doing an in-ground greenhouse, it's gonna have um, um, sandbag walls with cob over it, and I'm gonna have the water barrels in there, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have the stones right. on the bottom, so I'm gonna definitely thermal mass it out. Yeah. You know, the piping is coming in to cool it during the day. Is there a way to exchange that, that heat that I'm pumping out, maybe radiate it through the water barrels, or? You're going to block the, um, I mean, you're talking about actually taking from the top of the chimney and making it store in your water barrels, for example. You know, theoretically, that sounds like a good idea, but the loss of heat from the, from the top of that chimney as you route it all the way back down again and through into there is going to be, probably significant enough to offset the cost of doing all that. Plus, you're going to interrupt the flow of the chimney more by um, asking it to make that all big, long trip again. The lag between, you know, just because it's cool 
at night, at 11 o'clock, it's nice and cool outside, and it's not going to transfer down to the tube. So you, you can't ask the tubes to feed, to feed you heat now because it's, it's still, all that cool is still in there, you know, basically. I mean, there's other ways to do what you want to do. Uh, maybe absorbing the heat. Well, this is going to be difficult. Maybe if the water pipes actually went up the solar chimney and could, they were could, being heated would be by an idea. the And then circulate a pump through, the, through, the water, through or against the water barrels. Um, there has to be conductive heat exchange somehow. So either putting the tubes through the water barrels or against them so that there's some conductive thing. But basically, stealing the heat. Yeah, yeah. Stealing like a beer a beer facility, stealing the heat from the chimney and then routing it with a separate pump through. However, um, actually at the Mother Earth Fair, I'm going to be talking about a lot of this, not for a totally different application, but in April, at the end of April. And uh, actually, get to go, okay. The, um, uh, actually, when you start stealing, it, there's no free lunch. When you start stealing heat from that solar chimney, the function of the chimney itself is going to be uh, compromised. So, no, you could, though, put... It's very inexpensive, and, and really, you can make them yourself. In fact, there's a video we had on building solar, on building cheap solar um, thermal water panels. Um, you could put a dedicated set of thermal panels along the roof of the greenhouse or on the front, and just pump with, through a little. Uh, I don't have any pipe here, but uh, PEX pipe stuff we use in the floor of that thing, um, and just pump that through the barrels. Um, so that that daytime heat would just constantly be sucking into those barrels. It would not affect your, if you had them shielded from the rest of the building in the daytime, so the heat wouldn't be oozing out into the, where you want it to be cool. Right. At night, you can lift up the curtain or whatever you use to make that wall, and uh, could be, it could be insulation, it could be flexible insulation, it could be a piece of styrofoam that you pick up and fold back, whatever. But, but, so you'd be storing heat in the daytime with separate thermal, panels on a whole separate circuit with a little teeny pump, which wouldn't take much, and then, and then your cooling can still occur. So that would work. So that, you know, that's the kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, the greenhouse, I could be wrong, but I would assume that the solar chimney, chimney is kind of negligible, considering that during the day you're getting... You're, you're getting too much heat. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to have a difference between the heat, the, your, the place you're trying to cool, and the place you've got heat, for flow to happen. So, so I would assume the, with the greenhouse, you'd probably be fan assist. I would, yeah, I would, I would not bother to build a greenhouse. For at yeah. Night, yeah, I'll get if there was a way to close out two pipes and connect them, maybe you could run a fan to circulate that air through the ground and then have it come back in the other side. Yeah, you, could, you can do a loop. I mean, you can, you can arrange that from the ends. Yeah, yeah that's not impossible. But you know, in the greenhouse situation, I would say the solar chimney is probably not worth the trouble. It's just not going to work as well. Yeah. What they normally do in using earth tubes in greenhouses, they, they don't use a solar chimney. Mm -hmm. You have a pipe coming out, and you have an inline fan. Right. And so during the summertime, you're using that, and you push it through pipes. Mm -hmm. And usually they're buried within the greenhouse. Right, you know, right. Down right. Down right. Five feet. Yeah. 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 And then once it's made its route, it comes out the other end, mm -hmm. and it just goes into the greenhouse. Right. So, so in the summertime, it's taking the hot air, and it's exchanging it. It's cooling it off as it goes through the ground. Right. And then it comes out, and so it helps cool the air. In the wintertime, you want the reverse, and so um, you're taking the cooler air in the greenhouse, and see all that hot air you put in there, it's stored, right, it's stored within yeah. the soil. Yeah. And so you're, in the wintertime, you're taking the cooler air and running it through the pipes, and it picks up that heat that was stored, and it comes out right. more mm -hmm. Just in, into the greenhouse. And that's what I've been reading about, yeah. and what I was trying to wrap my head around, is getting a passive system to, to push that air because they're talking about pushing it through during the day versus at yeah, night. I don't know if you could do it with yeah, passive. Yeah, passive. I think you need a fan. Well, there are solar-powered uh, fans for yeah. attics or basements. Oh, yeah, no, there's no problem. Which would definitely work for the yeah. day. Yeah. I was wondering, could I hook up something like the electric fence charger I have for my, uh, my goat fencing? And that will stay on through most of the night and use that solar panel to kind of connect... A small-ish um, 
panel is may not drive the the fan that you need to do that, but it would not be difficult at all. And the price of solar panels is fairly inexpensive these days. Um, it would not be difficult at all to dedicate a panel to, um, to doing exactly what you're talking about. Because I don't think a pa there's not a passive system, but there definitely is a renewable energy system that's going to work for very little input. You know, because that's the way things are going. I mean, years ago, a couple even even 10 years ago, it was just the thought of four or five dollar a watt power was just prohibitive for a lot of things. But now it's a dollar. I mean, it's just it's cheaper than it's cheaper than the electric company in some cases. You know, so if I find anything out, I will be adding it to these handouts. They're on, they're posted online. It might take a little while, but they're they're going to be posted online. And then, as if it's important enough, I'll put it as an addendum. And if it's that important, we'll also reshoot, not reshoot, but we'll do a brief little five minute shooting on that particular thing. So, um, you know, and if you have any questions at all, really about anything particular or general or where to find something or can I aim you someplace, I, don't hesitate. It's Richard at livingwebfarms.org. I, I get enough email that I, you know, research stuff. It's not like I'm so overwhelmed with email that, you know, I, I have to refuse anybody. We, you know, I, I try to do my best for anybody who emails in on, on this stuff. And most of it comes from the workshops. You know, the, they'll see a video or they'll sit in a video and they'll say, you know, three weeks later they'll say, you know, I was thinking about this or that. Can I, can I ask you if this, just like you said, like how, how would that work? And, you know, we'll try to figure that out, you know. So thank you Thanks for coming.